You know, they keep saying we are a divided country right down the middle, and perhaps this tends to show it better than any metaphor you could possibly come up with. Uh, the 50 United States senators who, when all is said and done, are going to vote to advance uh, the judgeship of Brett Kavanaugh to become an associate justice, and the 48 who feel differently, and the one and one who are splitting their respective votes because they are not going to be part of this process technically. It is a split country, and it is illustrated here in the choice of a Supreme Court justice acted out again and again outside the very same Supreme Court where those gathering for Al Gore and those gathering for George Bush were making their anger known. So this notion that all of a sudden the Supreme Court has become politicized loses sight of something. It's called history. Been there, done that, gotten through that. We'll get through this. We're a country that's a lot bigger than what divides us. It's the country that defines us. Hope springs eternal, and right now, so does our coverage after this. It is noon on the East Coast, and after weeks of accusations and speculation and bitter arguments, the Senate now set to vote on whether or not Brett Kavanaugh will be the 114th Supreme Court Justice. This is special coverage here on the Fox News Channel on a Saturday afternoon. I am thrilled to be here with my colleague and friend Dana Perino. I'm Bill Hamring. Good day. And Good day I am you. Dana Perino. I'm very <laughs> thrilled as well. In just a few hours, the Senate will have its say after decades-old sexual assault allegations sparked weeks of heated debate. So, the biggest so turning point too. came yesterday. I'm sure you were there watching mm. it when moderate Republican Susan Collins, she tipped the scales in Kavanaugh's favor after a long speech. Another assertion that I've heard often is that Judge Kavanaugh cannot be trusted if a case involving alleged wrongdoing by the president were to come before the court. He has stated that Marbury versus Madison, Youngstown Steel versus Sawyer, and the United States versus Nixon are three of the four greatest Supreme Court cases in history. What do they have in common? Each of them is a case where Congress served as a check on presidential power. He believes that precedent is not just a judicial policy, it is constitutionally dictated to pay attention and pay heed to rules of precedent. Despite the turbulent, bitter fights surrounding his nomination, my fervent hope is that Brett Kavanaugh will work to lessen the divisions in the Supreme Court. We are covering this from all angles. Alan Dershowitz joins us in a moment with analysis, but we begin with Chief Congressional Correspondent Mike Emanuel. He's live on Capitol Hill. Mike, what are we hearing from other senators who intend to support Judge Kavanaugh later today? Dana, good afternoon. Republican supporters say the way Judge Brett Kavanaugh was treated during the confirmation process was shameful and a disservice to everyone involved. Nebraska's Deb Fisher told us a short time ago why she's a yes. My job as a senator is to assess the facts and make a judgment. I continue to support Judge Kavanaugh and believe he will serve our nation with integrity. Last night, Alaska's Lisa Murkowski, ex Murkowski explained why she's expected to be the only Republican opposed to confirmation. In my conscience, because that's how I have to vote, at the end of the day is with my conscience. I could not conclude that he is the right person for the court at this time. Protests continue today, but so far inside, it's been a little quieter than recent days. Dana? We're about three and a half, four hours away from the vote. Have Democrats given up now that all indications are that Judge Kavanaugh has the votes to be confirmed to the Supreme Court? No, Dana. Uh, the speech has continued around the clock on the Senate floor. And a short time ago, uh, Senator Ed Markey explained that he fears that a Justice Brett Kavanaugh will be protection for President Trump. When Donald Trump, under criminal investigation, with legal issues arising from that investigation potentially headed to the Supreme Court, and with Brett Kavanaugh having articulated strong views about shielding a sitting president from criminal proceedings, his confirmation is a constitutional crisis in the making. 
A Hawaii Democrat complained around 3 a.m. that Republicans should have found a new Supreme Court nominee after Judge Kavanaugh's emotional response in last week's high-stakes, high-pressure hearing, when Kavanaugh had to defend his name and his integrity after allegations were made against him. That whole thing was an emotional mess. And that actually should have been disqualifying. And that should have been the moment where members of the Republican Party just went over and said, listen, we got 18 conservative judges. Any of them could get confirmed. This guy is not right for the bench. With midterm elections just 31 days away, it'll be interesting to see the impact this fight has on those races. Dana? It will indeed. Uh, Mike Emanuel, thank you. We'll be checking back in with you, no doubt, as the day goes on. Think about the remarkable 10 days going back to the hearing with Judge Kavanaugh and Dr. Ford a week ago Thursday. That culminated in that dress by Susan Collins yesterday. And for those who watched it, 45, 50 minutes in length, you could divide it in two. She was setting up the legal arguments by which she was judging him as a judge based on his own history and what he may be portend for the court. And the second half, she just threw a spear through all these allegations that have been leveled against him publicly. And she also was very, probably the most animated I had ever seen her, talking about the fact that the, somebody in the world of Democrats had leaked the letter, mm -hmm. had forced Dr. Ford, who um, wanted to remain anonymous, that they had not taken the time to address these beforehand, and instead it was, she was just thrust into the public eye, and now here we are. And you wonder if she, was she a yes for a while? Did she come around to it at the end? You don't craft a speech like that, which was all printed out overnight. Well, also, and she, and she waited, um, she, didn't, she didn't give a hint of what she was going to say or how she was going to vote. Yeah. She actually made you listen to the whole speech, which was a very good case for Judge Kavanaugh. Yeah. Let's bring in Mike Lee now, Republican Senator from uh, Utah, member of the Judiciary Committee. Sir, how are you? And thank you for your time today. We, we believe we're three or four hours away. Do you, do you think you're across the line? Yeah, we think we're across the line. Of course, it's not over till it's over, but we believe we have the votes. We look forward to getting confirmed today. Senator, react to this. Jerry Nadler, Democrat from New York on the House side, he said the following about in pursuing impeachment charges against Kavanaugh if he is indeed on the court. Here's what he said in part. The Senate, having failed to do its proper constitutionally mandated job to advise and consent, we're going to have to do something to provide a check and balance to protect the rule of law and to protect the legitimacy of one of our most important institutions. Bear in mind that uh, impeaching a Supreme Court justice has never happened. It's been tried once in the House in 1804. Do you see this as a bruised party, or do you see this as something that could have the potential to go forward, sir? As far as what the House of Representatives does, look, if the Democrats took control of the House, it would be their prerogative. They could decide to do that. I don't think there's a valid basis for doing it, but they could decide to do it. That's not the end of the process. There's also a check and a balance on them. If they do that, it comes over to the Senate, and re removing uh, someone who's been impeached in the House requires two-thirds, a two-thirds supermajority vote in the Senate. I don't see that as likely. Senator, uh, it's Dana Perino. It's good to see you today. I wanted to ask you about just going forward. Now that there is no longer a 60-vote threshold for a Supreme Court nominee, do you think that what we've seen in the last two months, and in particular the last two weeks, is basically the embodiment of what we could expect going forward? Oh, I sure hope not, Dana. This has been disastrous. It's been hurtful to the American people. It's been hurtful to Dr. Ford and her family, Judge Kavanaugh and his family. I hope this is not where we're looking. Uh, yesterday, I gave some comments on the Senate floor in which I explained perhaps we shouldn't be looking so much to the Supreme Court. Perhaps we shouldn't be looking so much to centralize all decisions in Washington and within the courts and the administrative bureaucracies. If we allowed more decisions to be made locally by the people's elected representatives there, maybe people wouldn't be so upset about what happens here. Senator, what do you uh, make of the majority leader, Mitch McConnell, through this process? Um, some have suggested that this was his Henry Clay moment. Henry Clay, the, perhaps the most famous national lawmaker from the state of Kentucky, arguably back to the late 1850s. And I, I think also behind closed doors, they would suggest that McConnell was the silent assassin on this story. He had control of it from the beginning and saw it through almost now we see to the end. What is your feeling about how he conducted this? He's shown courage and he's shown resolve. He's shown and instilled in others a sense of calm in the middle of a storm. And uh, I, I applaud him for how well he's managed a whole lot of moving parts in a very tough situation. Senator, are you able to project a Justice Kavanaugh on the courts 
And with your judicial background and the, the, the legal mind that you have, after all, you were on a short list for this job at one time as well and perhaps again in the future. How does the court change, do you think? Well, I think Judge Kavanaugh, uh, when he becomes Justice Kavanaugh, is going to look a lot like Justice Gorsuch, Justice Alito, uh, Justice Thomas, and, and Justice Scalia before them. He's in the mold of the constitutional conservative, of the judicial conservative, who understands that the role of the judge and the Supreme Court is to figure out what the law means rather than what the court might wish it meant. And I think that will be good for the country. Uh, Senator, I wanted to ask you about temperament. Uh, Democrats really uh, apparently all of a sudden concerned about temperament, um, especially um, at that second hearing when uh, Brett Kavanaugh testified. And I wondered what you thought about that in terms of that argument being, um, um, by the Democrat standards, a mark against him. Yeah, I don't share their view. I mean, look, it's not entirely surprising that an individual, when he's had his name and his family dragged through the dirt as he has, it's going to show a little bit of emotion when he comes in front of a, a hostile body like he was facing that day. And the fact that that showed just means he was human. It doesn't mean that he's somehow unfit for judicial office. He's got a 12-year track record on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit showing he's very fit. All right, Senator Mike Lee, thank you today. We appreciate it. I want to bring in Alan Dershowitz, Harvard Law Professor Emeritus, also wrote the book, The Case Against Impeaching Trump. How are you doing, sir, on a Saturday afternoon? It's I'm, nice to see you today. I'm doing great, yeah. thank you. You know, Senator Lee may someday be a colleague of, of Kavanaugh. Mm -hmm. His name was very high on the list. He had a very, very distinguished uh, judicial, I mean, uh, uh, a legal career, and uh, he would serve with great distinction on, on any court. And... Uh, I think his views have to be looked at very seriously, and I tend to agree with much of what he said in terms of temperament, particularly. That's a make way argument. Um, when a judge has served on the bench for 12 years without a single complaint and taught at Harvard Law School, which ain't easy, let me tell you, without any uh, complaints, you don't judge him by perhaps what was not his finest a moment. He was outraged. He was furious. And uh, he held it mostly in check, but he said a few things that he shouldn't have said, just like Ruth Bader Ginsburg said a few things she shouldn't have said, and Justice O'Connor said a few things she shouldn't have said. I remember once when Chief Justice uh, Rehnquist berated a young woman in front of everybody in the Supreme Court because she had the temerity to call him Judge Rehnquist, and he mm. shouted at her, I am not a judge, I am the Chief Justice of the United States. Mm. I have seen judges bully, harass, pick on do everything, and we don't hear complaints from my liberal friends about judicial temperament, but when they don't like a justice, then they come up with an argument about judicial restraint. In this case, I don't think it makes no. any you sense know, just at going all. Over, His judicial conduct just, has been excellent over 12 yeah. years. Uh, just to go back a little bit, I, I thought the comments from the Republican senator from Tennessee, Bob Corker, were quite telling. Uh, three days ago, when he came out and said, I think it was three days ago, maybe it was two days ago, critical him for him this professor those who were sympathetic to dr. Ford could not recall or provide any evidence to support her story and there for he was a yes just in your own legal mind is that what it comes down to Look, for many no I don't think so I believed her I thought she made a very very compelling case but it's years and years and years ago could be a case of mistaken identification. She could misremember. He could misremember. I'm not in any way accusing her of doing anything wrong. The sexual McCarthyism came from people like Avenatti and his client. There's certainly a possibility, a possibility, that she may have made the whole thing up out of whole cloth, never met the man, didn't travel in the same social circles. I want the FBI to look into that because the Me Too movement needs to understand that there is no genetically linked lying gene or truth-telling gene and if if a woman deliberately and willfully falsely accuses somebody of sexual misconduct there have to be consequences so you know if there are going to be investigations let the investigations be fair on both sides to me the most important thing to investigate now is the process how do we improve the process how do we make sure this doesn't happen again and again and again especially in light of the end of the filibuster rule of, and a majority vote for the Supreme Court. We have to change the process and make it better. 
and, and and otherwise all Americans lose. We're the real losers here. Sir, you brought up Michael Avenatti, and that's one of the people. That's one of the people I wanted to ask you about because last night sure. the American Bar Association said they're going to reopen their evaluation for Brett Kavanaugh. They had said he would be a good justice, and now they want to reevaluate that. Do you think that the ABA should look at Michael Avenetti as well? I'm not going to call for anybody to look at anybody. Uh, I don't think I think it's a mistake to reevaluate Judge Kavanaugh. I don't think he did anything or said anything that results in evaluation. You judge a person by his 12-year judicial career, his teaching uh, career, not by uh, his worst moment. You know, in sports, in many sports, you discount the high, you discount the low, you look at the 10 scores in the middle. And I think when you're evaluating a judicial candidate, you do the same thing. I think the American Bar Association should stick with its evaluation, which was correct the first time. Look, he was not my candidate. I wanted to see Merrick Garland. I'm a liberal Democrat. Uh, I don't know how I would have voted as a Senate senator on the issue of his judicial philosophy. What outrages me is the process that was used to uh, 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 accuse him without a full opportunity to investigate and respond. And what outrages me even more as a 50-year professor at Harvard Law School is the mob rule we're seeing now of students demanding that he not be allowed to teach. It's, it reminds me of when I was in college of McCarthyism, where students demanded that communist professors who had been communists when they were 20 years old or alleged communists when they were 20 years old be fired. We have to get back to a time where we tolerate differences among people, forgive the past. I'm hoping that Justice Kavanaugh will learn from this experience and will end up being libertarian end up being very concerned we, we, we about the process, time like that, end you, up you being just concerned said, about free speech. You, you he could said, turn out to be a great justice. Yeah, I apologize for the interruption here. You just said America lost no on this. Well, what if Kavanaugh was denied? And denied... Uh, America uh, would have lost... But, but, but you, I mean, in, in a case of law, you're looking for evidence. And you're looking for facts. And all we had, all we had were words. So can, can you mm -hmm. deny his nomination based on words? What, what would the loss have been if that were the case? I think much greater. I would never have denied his nomination on the basis of either his judicial performance in front of the committee or the allegations against him, even though they may very well have some or more than some uh, truth. I think it's all about process, and I think the process failed. I think all Americans lost. The ACLU, big losers. Democrats, big losers. I'm not sure how the Republicans emerge from this. I think President Trump uh, was a loser when he made the statements he made, uh, mocking Ford. She didn't deserve that, uh, but it shouldn't have influenced, and apparently it didn't influence the okay. outcome of the proceedings. We have to improve. We have to be better than this. Hope to get you back a little later, okay? Alan yeah. Dershowitz. Thank, thank you, Alan Dershowitz. So Dershowitz thank and you. Bill, we are off to a thank good start you. here. We have got a big show mm -hmm. ahead. Um, we're going to get closer to the uh, final vote. It's coming up around... No, 3.30, 4 o'clock, so okay. you're going to want to stick, up, uh, stick with us. And up next, we have Tom Dupre, Chris Starwalt, Marie Harf, and Andrew McCarthy as we look at what has been a wild few weeks. This confirmation process has become a national disgrace. The Constitution gives the Senate an important role in the confirmation process. But you have replaced advice and consent with search and destroy. Here on the East Coast, Fox News Alert now on this Saturday afternoon. We are in the waiting zone, waiting for what is expected to be a final Senate vote on Judge Brett Kavanaugh's confirmation. Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell saying that Republicans refuse to give in to pressure from the left. They've been after all of us. We've, we've sort of been under assault, and everybody decided to stand up to the mob. The mob was not able to intimidate the Senate. We stood up to the mob. We did the right thing for a good man. I feel a lifetime appointment on the Supreme Court. All right, let's bring in our guest. Andy McCarthy is with us in New York. He's a former U.S. attorney and a Fox News contributor. We also have our Washington panel. Marie Harf is a co-host of Benson and Harf and a Fox News contributor. Chris Starwalt is a Fox News politics editor. And Tom Dupree, he's a former deputy assistant attorney general under President George W. Bush. Uh, we just had the soundbite from Mitch McConnell. Chris Starwalt, let me go to you. In doing some reporting, you know, I checked in with somebody on a Thursday night. Uh, are you going to have the votes or are you not? And the source said to me, Nervous senators will be nervous, but we will get it done by Saturday. Do you think that Mitch McConnell always thought he could get to this point? Do you know what I find absolutely hysterical uh, is that Mitch McConnell, 
once deemed the enemy of MAGA nation, once the uh, person that was the number one priority for Steve Bannon and others, that he had to be removed, he had to be outed, because otherwise uh, the swamp would stand. And here is the guy who is now the stud duck. This is the guy who, for every Republican in the country, for every conservative, for everybody, this is the guy who keeps over and over and over delivering the goods for Republicans and for conservatives. It's astonishing. The other thing is, is that he's, he's responsible for trying to keep the Republican majority in the Senate, and we've got a big midterm coming up in about 30 days. Uh, there's a real clear politics average on West Virginia, which I know, of course, you know a lot about. Joe Manchin, the Democrat incumbent, at 45.7%. Patrick Morrissey, well behind at 36.3 percent. Your thoughts about West Virginia, the Kavanaugh nomination and confirmation vote today? Well, the first thing I think about West Virginia is that they're going to beat Kansas by 50 points today well, that's good in to football. Know. <laughs> the second thing that I think is, I wrote this yesterday in the halftime report, I said that uh, Joe Manchin looks slicker than a greased watermelon and twice as hard to catch. Uh, he has played this so expertly. He has found his way through this. He not only in the end gets to vote for a nominee who is extraordinarily popular, extremely popular in his state, but also gets to take credit for saving the nomination because he joined the gang that forced the FBI investigation that got the thing over the finish line. So he has played this right a couple of different ways, and he is looking quite good for re-election now. Yeah. Andrew McCarthy here in New York. You've been watching this. We discussed things a bit earlier before we came on the air. And what is your sense right now about, uh, what, are we three, four hours away? Perhaps a little more, maybe a little less. Yeah, well, I, I'm always from the uh, it ain't over till it's over school, and it seems to me that there's a very small margin for error. So if you're in the Kavanaugh corner, as I have been, you're cautiously optimistic. But t from my perspective, Bill, it's cautious. Uh, there's a, you know, there's a long time, and there's been many twists and turns. There's not been a single day, it seems to me, in the last three weeks where we haven't seen anything or something that was unanticipated. So. I'm holding my breath. Yeah. You study the court quite a bit. Uh, what do you think of Justice Stevens coming out the other day at the age of 98, this on the eve of the vote, and you think about Elena Kagan and uh, Justice Sotomayor just yesterday uh, when, the, when, when they did interviews, and Kagan said the following, just put the words on the screen, has been an extremely important thing for the court that in the last 40 years, starting with Justice O'Connor and continuing with Justice Kennedy, there has been a person who found the center where people could not predict in that sort of way. I think going forward, that sort of middle position, it's not so clear whether we will have it. Yeah, I, I respectfully suggest that this is part of the problem with the court. I mean, the reason that we have the protesters outside, the reason that this process has been so vicious at times is because the court has assumed a place in our society and in our government, which is not the place that was the intention of the framers. I think if what our expectation was, was we had nine legal craftsmen who were uh, expert at figuring out what the precedents were and were applying those faithfully to the facts, there wouldn't be a single reason to have a single person outside demonstrating the Supreme Court. The problem is that the court is now seen, and this is through a lot of its own doing, as a kind of a super legislature, as a political body, as a body that actually gets influenced by the crowds that are outside, as a body that gropes to have a middle rather than just figuring out what the law is and applying it to the facts. So I, I must say, I think that's part of what the big problem is. And I think people might add that um, Congress is also at fault there as well. I want to bring in Marie Harf. She's down there in D.C. From a Democratic perspective, you know, this has been a wild few weeks. Um, and I wonder if you think that the Democrats, as much as they are disappointed uh, that this nomination is going to go through, do they feel that not only have they failed to stop Judge Kavanaugh, but are they worried that the whole effort may have backfired because you start to see a narrowing of the gap in the generic ballot going into the midterms, Republicans with their enthusiasm way up to where it was, from where it was about three weeks ago. And I wonder what you think about where we are right now and if this was a good strategy. Well, Dana, this moment feels much bigger than just Brett Kavanaugh and, frankly, than just the Supreme Court. If our viewers look at the screen right now, on the left-hand side, they see protesters at the Supreme Court. They're not just talking about Brett Kavanaugh. They are fired up. And you are right that, especially in the Senate races, I think this may narrow some of the options for Democrats. But if we look at the House races, the districts that Democrats need to win, these are full of independent women, of some Republican women who... Look at what's happened in the last few weeks, not just what's happened to Dr. Ford, 
but President Trump standing up at a rally, mocking many people felt like Christine Blasey Ford, Orrin Hatch telling survivors of sexual abuse to grow up, and then he would talk to them. Chuck Grassley saying more women who are Republicans don't serve on the Judicial Committee, maybe because the workload is too hard. It, it's, it's bigger than just this one thing. It's a lot of independence, a lot of women, all Bill. Men in America to shut up. A lot, but look, but Bill, what I'm talking about here is a lot of women who feel like one year out from the Me Too movement beginning, that over the past few weeks, the Republican Party has given them lip service, but not really told them that they matter in terms of what happens here. And that is a perception. Just look at these protesters, Bill. That is a perception that's out there. And I think in 30 plus days when we go to the polls, especially in these House races that are decided in much smaller yeah. populations, Democrats may actually benefit politically so from we, this process. We have 30, 31 days to chew on that. We're going to come back to that topic, too. Maria, I just want to squeeze mm -hmm. in time to pretty quickly before we go to the break here. Tom, what is your sense about what will unfold in three and a half hours, give or take? Well, I, I am more than guardedly optimistic at, at this point, Bill. I am extremely optimistic. I think there is little doubt that Judge Kavanaugh has the votes that he needs to get over it, and I am hopeful that if and when he is confirmed and becomes Justice Kavanaugh, that the nation as a whole can begin the process of trying to put all this back together. And I hope that the Supreme Court can at some point in some way re-attain the, the sense of legitimacy that it has so held for so long in our nation, but that processes like this, I worry, over time corrode and undercut people People's perception of the court as a nonpartisan institution. We got a terrific panel. Stand by to all of you, okay? We're going to use you throughout the next several hours, all right? Thank you for that. Dana, what's next? All right, we are just a few hours away from that final vote on Brett Kavanaugh. Top of the next hour, we will speak to Senate Judiciary Committee Chairman Chuck Grassley. I cannot imagine what you and your family have gone through. Boy, y'all want power. God, I hope you never get it. I hope the American people can see through this sham. That you knew about it and you held it. All right, we're back. All eyes now focused on the Senate floor as we await the final confirmation vote on Judge Brett Kavanaugh. The battle over his nomination also serving as a strong rallying cry for President Trump on the campaign trail ahead of the midterms. So Chief White House Correspondent uh, John Roberts, he's going to stand by for us right now. Oh, there he is. He's live, actually, where President Trump will soon be taking off for a rally in Kansas. Um, that might be a rally to watch, John. Uh, it's, it certainly will be. There's no question about that. And good afternoon to you, Dana. Uh, the president leaving just before 3 o'clock this afternoon for Topeka, Kansas. He's been in the residence all morning, I assume, probably watching the proceedings as we head toward this vote. If so, good afternoon, Mr. President. Uh, he tweeted about it all this morning, saying, quote, Women for Kavanaugh and many others who support this very good man are gathering all over Capitol Hill in preparation for a 3 to 5 p.m. vote. It's a beautiful thing to see, and they are not paid protesters who are handed expensive signs. Big day for America. Uh, Judge Kavanaugh's confirmation team has been in touch with uh, key members of the Senate just to make sure that everything stays on track. I'm told uh, in the last few minutes that everything looks like it is going to be on track. The president, for his part, called Judge Kavanaugh this morning to give him a little bit of a pep talk. Here's uh, Mercedes Schlapp. The president did speak with Brett Kavanaugh. Uh, I know it's one of these moments, again, that I'm, I'm incredibly proud of, of working with this president who has stood by Judge Kavanaugh, has really made it a point to explain to the American people why Judge Kavanaugh is the right person at the right moment for the court. First Lady Melania Trump, in the meantime, continues her tour of Africa, touching down in Egypt. She weighed in on the upcoming vote. Listen here. If we're talking about the, the Supreme Court and uh, Judge Kavanaugh, um, I think he's highly qualified for the Supreme Court. I'm glad that uh, Dr. Ford was heard. I'm glad that J Judge Kavanaugh was heard. FBI investigation was done, is completed, and Senate voted. So here's our expectations for how the rest of the day is going to unfold. Uh, according to uh, Senate Majority Leader McConnell, looks like the vote is going to happen sometime between 4 and 5 o'clock, according to White House sources I talked to, with Senator Lisa Murkowski voting present instead of no. The final vote will likely be 50 to 48. We will likely hear from the president. He'll either do something aboard Air Force One or when he arrives in Topeka, Kansas later this afternoon or at that rally tonight. And then the ceremonial swearing-in of Judge Kavanaugh 
will take place here at the White House, likely Monday or Tuesday. They're just trying to figure out the best time. Dana, we also hope to find out soon uh, where Judge Kavanaugh will be watching the proceedings, whether he'll be doing it at home or whether he'll do it in his chambers in the D.C. Circuit Court. We'll find that out for you. Hopefully Dana? surrounded by friends and family. All right, Bill. Uh, John, Robert, excuse me. Thank you. Meanwhile, you're Dem Bill. I'm Bill. That's right. <laughs> and you're Dana. <laughs> Democrats and attorneys for Dr. Christine Blasey Ford insist the FBI's seventh investigation conducted over the past week was not thorough enough in the history of Judge Kavanaugh. Republicans say the Democrats have been aggressive trying to dig into the judge's past. What you're saying, if, if I understand it, is that the allegations by Dr. Ford, Ms. Ramirez, and Ms. Fetnick, Swetnick um, are, are wrong. Yeah, that, that is emphatically what I'm saying. I'm innocent of this charge. And you're prepared for an FBI investigation? They don't reach conclusions. You reach the conclusion. No. So you're saying there's never been a case where you drank so much that you didn't remember what happened the night before or part of what happened? That's, you're asking about, yeah, blackout. I don't know. Have you? That was 10 days ago. Republican Senator Deb Fisher from Nebraska is with me now. How are you, Senator? And good afternoon to you on a Saturday. It feels a little bit like a health care weekend vote. Feels a little bit like repeal and replace, yeah. although that happened at 2.30 in the morning. How does it feel to you today? Uh, things are pretty calm right now in the Capitol building, and uh, people are doing their uh, work. I've been in my office just uh, looking through some constituent mail and things, and about 3.30, uh, as my understanding, is when the vote could take place at have, this have point. You, have you shared your last thoughts on the floor of the Senate already? I have. I uh -huh. did this morning about 10.30. What, is, what was your address, your message? You know, my message was we need to look at the facts in the case. Uh, this is a man who has been on the D.C. Circuit Court for 12 years. He has written about 300 opinions. 200 of those were controlling opinions. 13 have his uh, writings in Supreme Court uh, uh, decisions that they've made. So he is uh, well respected. He is known for uh, being an intellectual. He is known for uh, being um, thorough in his work. I'm certain you remember 27 years ago, Anita Hill and Clarence Thomas. The country was exceedingly divided at that point, too. I think we can both agree on that. Uh, but the country went forward. It did heal, uh, and for many or for most it did. What is your sense about what this process has done to neighbors and friends and people across the country? Well, our country is very polarized. It was polarized before this. I've been in the Senate six years. Uh, when I first arrived here, the Republicans were in the minority, so I had my first two years as being a minority member of the Senate and saw um, only only 15 amendments come up on the floor of the United States Senate in all of 2014. Uh, the system was broken then and polarized. We tried to uh, work together and work across the aisle. That was a commitment that I made to Nebraskans, and I continue to do that. But it's going to take some work now after this. Uh, I'm going to continue to look for issues, policy, that I can work with my Democrat colleagues on so that we can see some good solutions, some good policies, some good legislation passed that will make lives better for the American people. I guess last point here, um, it's not yet official. Do you expect surprises today or do you think it's done? I think it's done. I okay. think it's done. Uh, you know, we saw Senator Collins make a magnificent speech on the floor of the United States Senate. It is the most um, moving, compelling, focused, thorough, well-reasoned -re speech that I have seen in my lifetime on the floor of the Senate. Oh, it, quite she, a bit. Uh, she did it, yes, she did a fabulous job in, in rationally laying out a case, putting the facts uh, forward, and uh, that's what the Senate should be. And she gave us a great example that we all need to follow in the future, and we need to step up our game so that we're able to put forward the facts and then make the judgment. Thank you, Senator. Deb Fisher is a Republican Thank from you. Nebraska. I think we're three hours away, give or take. Thank you for your time. Be in. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. And our special coverage of the Brett Kavanaugh confirmation vote continues. Carl Rove is on deck with analysis next.
He's been an incredible judge because they know that Judge Kavanaugh will protect, uphold, and defend the Constitution of the United States as written. Welcome back as we await a final confirmation vote on Judge Brett Kavanaugh, Senator Susan Collins' decision to vote yes, earning praise from Republicans, including former President George H.W. Bush, the former president, tweeting, quote, political courage and class. I salute my wonderful friend and her principal leadership. Joining me now is Carl Rowe, former senior advisor and deputy chief of staff for President George W. Bush. Um, I want to maybe just from a historical standpoint, you are a historian. Where do you where does this fall in in Supreme Court battles? Is this the biggest one and the most tough one, the harshest one you've ever seen? Yes, I think it is. Uh, the uh, Thomas hearings, as ugly as they were, look tame by comparison. Uh, of course, we have the Robert Bork hearing in the 80s, which was very ugly, uh, but never went beyond the committee uh, and to the floor. And but this is this is uh, unique. Uh, in its ugliness, in its viciousness, and its distortion. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the simple fact that this could have been avoided by if uh, Dianne Feinstein had provided that letter to the FBI in July so that Dr. Ford could be anonymously, keep her anonymity and still be interviewed and give the list of witnesses. Instead, we saw this play out uh, on, on our television screens. Right. and. It was not a pretty sight for the Senate or the country. When we uh, led into the segment, we showed a tweet um, from President George H.W. Bush, 41. Of course, now he's right. He's up in Maine, where Senator Collins is from. I think we showed a picture of George W. Bush. Uh, he obviously didn't tweet, but I wanted to get your take on this. Um, a lot of people saying that they've not seen the GOP this united in many, many years. And George W. Bush played a little bit of a role behind the scenes, talking to some senators where he could, because, of course, he supported Brett Kavanaugh. Tell me about that in terms of GOP uh, unification at this time, especially just 30 days before the midterms. Yeah, I think the issue of both Kavanaugh's competence, the fact that it's the Supreme Court and that matters a lot to Republicans, and then the uh, basic unfairness of what the Democrats did in this is all combined to unite the Republican Party. And while you're correct to point out that uh, President Bush, 43, did make phone calls to senators, he actually had a more substantial role in that he is the man who credentialized uh, Brett Kavanaugh. He, Brett Kavanaugh, as you, know, you and I both know well, was our uh, colleague in the White House as staff secretary, and President Bush appointed him to the D.C. Circuit, the second highest court in the land from which uh, Judge Kavanaugh has uh, compiled an exemplary record of service over 12 years. So uh, this is a moment where the Republican Party is united, and the, and, and the Democratic Party is not completely united. And I'm not talking about Joe Manchin. I'm talking about the hard left of the Democratic Party. A number of groups uh, sent a very tough letter to Chuck, Chuck Schumer a number of weeks ago and said, if you fail to stop Brett Kavanaugh, it will be your fault as the leader of the Senate Democrats, and we will hold you responsible. There's going to be a lack of enthusiasm about in that, some Carl, quarters about it. Um, because two big super PACs, on the, the, our Democratic super PACs, have said that they are no longer going to support Phil Bredesen in Tennessee, who is um, challenging Marsha Blackburn there for that Senate seat, and that they were taking money out of Joe Manchin's race there in West Virginia. Are they shooting themselves in the foot there? Well, I think they're shooting themselves in the, well, I, I shouldn't say this. I think that, 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 that Bredesen and Manchin had very difficult decisions to make because if they had gone against uh, Judge Kavanaugh, they'd be dead in their states. Uh, just like Heidi Heidkamp, I think her decision to, to vote against uh, Kavanaugh is a sign that she knew that she was on her way to a double-digit defeat by Kevin Kramer in North Dakota, and she wanted to pretty up her resume for service in a future Democratic administration. But if either Bredesen or Manchin had come out against Kavanaugh, I think it would have dealt their campaigns a serious blow. And Bredesen, who's starting to fall behind, the polls are starting to show in this very red state, won by Donald Trump by 26 votes, that uh, Marsha Blackburn is starting to pull, pull away. Uh, he knew that if he came out yeah. against Kavanaugh, it hurt him deeply, and he waited until the very last minute hoping that this cup would pass from his lips so to speak all right carl rove thank you so much we'll be back in touch with you senators still facing pressure in the final hours before a vote on supreme court nominee brett kavanaugh as demonstrators continue to descend on capitol hill we'll have a live report straight ahead
Back here in New York, along with Dana Perino, I'm Bill Hemmer. We're closing in on the hour, soon to be a vote on the floor of the Senate. Mitch McConnell promised repeatedly this week there would be a vote this week, and technically it looks like that will happen. Back with us, Tom Dupree, Chris Steyerwalt, Marie Harf, and Andrew McCarthy here in New York. That is a picture from the Capitol. Dana, that's a live image here now from our Fox crew in Washington. And that has grown just in the last hour that we've been on the air. We also know there are protesters on the steps of the Supreme Court just a short talk away. Not sure if this is the same group or a different group or a growing group. Nonetheless, Andrew, we have watched protesters make their way to Capitol Hill. There was a, there was a live reporter on a bus on CNN Wednesday morning. I do believe it's 6.20 a.m. reporting live on the bus that was rolling down the highway through New Jersey. Uh, the left has been mobilized. We will see how much and how long it lasts. I thought it was very telling that Jillian Turner earlier today uh, said that she did not see a single protester in support of Judge Kavanaugh today. Not one. They were all out there yesterday and the day prior, Andrew, but not today. Well, I, I just think this is a, it's a sad reflection of what the court has become and what it is not supposed to be in this society, which is the place where we go to decide the way that we live, the, the place that we go to make the decisions that a democratic society is supposed to make through its elected representatives. And it's a measure of how vicious this process is that what we're looking at is a court that actually fulfills a role that is not what's meant for the court to fulfill. And when you have demonstrations outside the court like that, and you have demonstrations about a Supreme Court justice like that, what you're essentially saying is we want the court to be responsive to political pressure when the court is actually there to resolve the, the court's job is hard enough as it is. It is to resolve the difficult legal issues that have to be resolved. Uh, it's not to be our, our political barometer. It's just not. Yeah. We expect a vote to be 50 yeas and 48 nays at the moment. One will vote present, one will vote absent. Mm -hmm. Clarence Thomas, 25 years ago, what was it? Well, it was close, less than that, like yeah. less than that. But, you know, 52, John, 48. but I think, you know, you look at John Roberts in 2005, yeah. he, had, he got 78 votes. It was quite bipartisan, so we've come a long mm. way. Uh, 25 years ago, Ruth Bader Ginsburg at 96 votes. Right. Just remarkable. Chuck Grassley is on deck. He is live. Chairman of the Judiciary Committee is coming up right now.